Well, it's so good to welcome Mark back to the podcast. How are you doing today, Mark? Very well. I'm honored to be a, a two-time, you know, like Saturday Night Live, you're a five-time, you're, you're a five-time uh, host is a big deal. Uh, I guess a two-time uh, guest on, uh, on your podcast is just as important. It is. It's really important. I don't have guests on often, so, you know, <laughs> it's good to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. So I had to change the question because you came on before, so I had to add, add a new opening question for you. This is a brand new opening question just for right. you. I'm ready. All right. So what's been happening in your life recently that you that you expected, didn't expect, or didn't expect? Um, you know, it's, it's, everything to me is about is BS. It's all BS. It's all belief system, you know, belief, be, everything right. starts with a belief system. So I, I think that the thing is, is that you train your mind on the expect, on the, on the expected to say, you know, in this life, you don't get what you want, or you don't get what you need, or you don't get what you deserve. You get what you expect. And so I think for the most part that I, I sort of train my mind to, to expect good things to happen, to expect what I'm, I want to happen to happen. Um, and sometimes it doesn't, but it's, that's the unexpected. Um, but I think if you're being more granular about it, I think that, you know, I've got five kids between 17 and 25. And I thought that once you kind of raise the kids and get them out of the house, our youngest goes to college next year, well, four kids in college, one's already graduated. The unexpected to me was that I thought, I thought that the, pro not the problems would go away, but I thought that the parenting would ease up from the day to day. And I realized that, it's, I've never been more in the middle of everything. And by the way, most of it with great joy, others with some, you know, uh, you know, you know, the things you got to do to be a good parent and uh, the discipline and, uh, and the problems you have to help uh, kids with uh, from time to time. But I thought, I thought that was unexpected. I thought, uh, you know, I thought that my, not that I would never stop being a parent, but I thought a lot of the day-to-day -day responsibilities would ease up. And I think they've just gotten, you know, harder. You're dealing with, you know, um, you know, I th and I think the challenge is the challenge. I think when you see this unexpected stuff is, as somebody that is very empathetic and solves problems every day, and that's what I do for a living. As a you know, as a key business strategist and critical thinker and financial advisor to to to, to, to folks, is you want to go in there and solve your kids' problems, and and you have the and oftentimes you have the resources to do that, but I think. It's very, very hard, and sometimes I don't do it as well as I could. But sometimes you got to step back and let them solve their own problems and figure it out for themselves, and that's how they get strong. And um, you know, almost like they they talk about like a, a like a bird, if, you know, that the way their wings get strong so they can fly is to break out of the shell. If if the you know if if they if if, if the shell is opened uh, other than by their own wings, they wind up not being able to fly and they get eaten by prey because they can't fly. They're running around on the ground, and um, I try to remember that, but sometimes I forget, and so I'm yeah. I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to be a a better uh, a better parent by sometimes doing less for my kids, not more. That makes sense. Uh, my kids are getting older too, and and you're right. Parenting never goes away; it changes. Uh, I think the the neat thing about parenting is you're right. You you have to learn when they were younger. You you wanted to kind of teach them and do things for them. Now you're kind of getting in the middle of sometimes relationship issues, um, financial planning, futures, uh, decisions they're going to make on their first home, their first kid, their college. I mean, all those things that you didn't think you were going to have to decide anymore. Now you're kind of coming alongside and you say you're, you're being a coach now, which is more than a parent. It's kind of fun in some ways. If you, if you like that idea of coaching them to help them to figure, like you said yourself, figure out the answers already inside of them. Right, right. Yeah, and I, I think I think I think part of becoming an adult is being able to stand on your own two feet, um, and stand up for yourself. Right. And, you know. And by the way, if I don't do a good job with my kids, what 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 shot do my grandkids have? Right. Exactly. <laughs> I'm always curious, people like yourself. Um, what books have you read in your life that have changed your life the most? Well, well first of all, I think that's an awesome question because. You know, clearly, if you want to see what your life looks like in 10 years, it's two things. It's the books you read and the people you hang out with. But um, so I could and so I, I consider myself a voracious reader, um, although, you know, my friends bust me because I, you know, I had my my third book out last year. And so, you know, they always say to me, you know, well, uh, 
you know, you've written three books now, that's two more than you've read, um, which is, you know, not, not true. So, you know, of course I need to then say to them, well, you know, now that I'm a best-selling author, I've got to get a better set of friends than you. So this will be our last conversation. Um, but, but, but having said that, I, I think that you know, reading is, is that what separates uh, entrepreneurs from, from just people that own a business or entrepreneurs from people who just have a job. And so, you know, I, I could tell you so many books that made a difference in my life. Some, it, some books just changed how I thought about things because the problem is never the problem. It's how you think about the problem. But if I'm looking for specific books, like, you know, Outliers for Malcolm Gladwell was, was an important book for me. And it was an important book for me because it made me realize that to master a subject, you had to put 10,000 hours in. And all of the things that, and the confidence that you needed, that, that you had confidence once you had that. Or, or you know, as somebody that, that has hired and unfortunately have had to fire uh, people over the last 38 or 39 years, um, the book Traction by Gino Wickman was profound. And he has a, a system called EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. Um, which, um, you know, which, which, which allowed me to get very clear on who needed to be in our organization. It made me very clear that you're not growing a business, you're growing people. And so then how do I make sure that I've got the right people in my organization, which I think was, was terrific. I think uh, a book uh, that came out relatively recently that described our business to a T, I just wasn't eloquent enough to write it myself. Um, you know, meaning, meaning, you know, they, they laid out was Dan Sullivan had a book uh, with a, with a co-author uh, on a book called Who Not How. And it, 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 you know, because the question that was, has been asked to me probably 10,000 times in some form key has been, how do I grow my income? How do I grow my business? How do I grow my freedom of time? How do I grow my freedom of relationship? How do I grow my freedom of purpose? One of the five freedoms. And I always thought that was the wrong question that the right question should be, who do we need to collaborate with to grow our income, our business, our freedom of time, relationship, and purpose? And it allowed me to, to, to realize that 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 was that 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 was the key that was the key to a successful entrepreneurship. I can I go on. I, can, I have a hundred favorite books. You know, <laughs> so you've re so you've read more than two. Yeah, I continue to read. You know, I you know I I think that that's you always have an opportunity to learn. And, and, and I think the other thing too, is that sometimes it's like, you know, like what, what are some of like the, I, I re read that great book, um, it was out, out, I don't know, 10 years ago on, on Genghis Khan, but you know, the, the idea is that there was so much learning involved, you know, in, in terms of, in terms of just how he operated and, you know, he and the mongrels created a, you know, both terror and fear and a, and a culture, um, you know, not that I want to become Genghis Khan, but I think you can learn from you know, how they, how they, you know, in many ways created modern society. Um, and so, you know, you know, as opposed, that was, I thought it was more, it was a biography sort, sort of, or it was a biography, but the learning of how I could use the practicality in our business and in my life made it, made a difference. Love that. This is a new question too. I, I love this. I, I want to talk to somebody like yourself. How would you describe your leadership style? And um, on top of that, also, how does that style impact the ones or those around you in your business when i was younger my leadership style was called impatience um and, and it wasn't a very effective style i think it was um you know i you know i, I when i realized that the, the key factor in improvement was a was a couple of things number one is when the clients were always no, numero uno clients could do, do no wrong in my mind and um when I realized that the people that worked with and for me were not only as important, but in many cases more important than the clients, not that the clients were still not numero uno, but when I realized that, that was a, that was a game changer in terms of my leadership style. The second thing is when I realized that I'm always at my best when I'm serving others. And so the idea is that when I could use servant leadership and lift people up and, and not be the leader because my, my name was on your check, or because I was the CEO, but my leadership came from that I was pouring into people and investing in them both personally and professionally, and I was there to help them be the best version of themselves, and I was I was help, help them to, to to meet their goals and aspirations. Then I became the kind of leader that I would want to work for, and that that ultimately that maybe early in my career because I had no roadmap or no guide to do this. 
you know, I was just kind of fumbling around. But once you know, that was a that was a like a eureka light bulb kind of key moment is that, you know, who would I want to work for? And I wanted to become that kind of person that I wanted to work for, that people would 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 lead would lead with me. And I think the other thing with leadership is you've got to be the dirtiest key in the office, you know, meaning that ultimately you can't ask anybody to do something that you wouldn't do yourself or have not done yourself. Now, maybe some of the tasks in my office I'm not doing anymore, but technology improvements aside, I did it. And so I wouldn't ask you to do it, Keith, if I wouldn't do it myself. That's great. Nordhaus kind of makes a point that for leadership, you probably don't just have one style. You have to kind of adjust and adapt to situations. So how do you, how does your leadership style adapt to the situations you need at the moment? Well, I, I think it's, I, I, I mean, part of, part of it's circumstances, but I think part of it is that, you know, your super, my superpower might be to be able to read people and read what languaging says. Like I, I, I seem to, um, you know, maybe it's just also having done this for so long and worked in a business with people, you can you can read a few things. You can read what they're saying between the lines, and you can get the feeling on that. And um, you know, like as an example, like like a, you know, I, I remember you know a few year, a few years ago, people were telling us that this key employee was leaving, and I kept saying, no, they're not leaving. And they go, no, no, they're leaving. They, they're, they're, I go, they're not leaving. They go, and they never, they didn't leave. And I go, well, how did you know this? And I said, I knew that because they stopped, dis they were still disagreeing with me. You know, meaning, if, you know, if you and I had checked out of our relationship, we, I'd be like, I'm, we're done. But if you, they, they still cared, they still wanted to be there. And I still, you know, want, or, or, you know, what, even when people say the opposite, you know, they are leaving because of how they behave. And I think part of it is, part of the guild as a leader is to find out how to get almost like a coach in sports to figure out how to get the best out of your people. You know, some people, some some people really respond well to tough love. Other people get paralyzed by it, you know. And, and I think part of it is is really trying to try understand how do you get the best out of people. And you know, I think I think part of it is not because you have some secret, you know, playbook on that. I think it's really getting to know people in relationships and getting to understand how they react to things. And I, and I think and I think it starts by, you know, showing people what a great job looks like. You know, getting clear on expectations, communicating with people. And then, and then trying to find the method to get the very, very best out of them. And not the very best out of them because it serves you or it serves the business, but because they know that you have their interest at heart. That, you know, to me, that everything must be what we call a class three experience. It's got to be great for our customer first. It's got to be great for them second. And it's got to be great for me and the firm third. And, and you know, there's no situation that I want to be involved in where for you to win, I have to lose, or for I, for me to win, you have to lose. I want to create a situation where everybody can do better by working together. That's great. What you're kind of describing a little bit is your company culture. How would you define what a good company culture looks like? Um, you know, I, you know, I think I think part of it is where everybody has the same core values. You know, meaning. Meaning there, there were times in my life where I had very smart people who worked for me, but didn't believe in the culture. You know that that you know what, and so I I was wondering why it was a misfit, and it did it did not work. And I think you know so like you know one of the things like people say like how do you get people to be so engaged and work so hard? And I would say, well, if they weren't working hard or engaged, they wouldn't be working here. You, you know, meaning <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know what I mean. <laughs> I mean, you know, meaning or, you know, or, you know, that, that, you know, you know, you know, we, you know, we have a culture where, we're, or, you know, for me, I'm always at my best. I mentioned this when I'm serving others. I want people in our culture to be there. That's the kind of culture that we set. I want to, we want to create an experience for our clients. We want to, we want to be emotionally fit. You're dealing with people's lives, their money, their most sensitive and deepest, darkest secrets. You know, part of that is you have to be emotionally fit when that, that occurs. You know, you know, you want to you want to create that, and every time we have not been true to that, either in hiring or or in 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 coaching our folks, if they if they seem to get out of out of a balance with our core values, that's when our company takes a step backward. Backward. I mean, the the definition to me of an unstoppable team is when you have your entire team in in momentum, 
and and I and I and and the and the thing that's the hardest part is that there are very good people who are very talented or who you have great affection for personally or who 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 do some things so extraordinarily well but there are some things that are deal breakers in that place because you know as good as they may be in in, in so many areas they become a cancer to the organization which allows other people to say well if that person can get away with that or do that well then why can't i and that's the beginning of the of the of the breaking of your culture and so i think you have to you have to kind of coach the people and to say say to them you know, you know, here's who we are and here's the kind of organization we're running. If this is not the right place for you, let me help you find a place that might be better for you, that might uh, tolerate you uh, not showing up on time on a consistent basis or, or you know, or, um, you know, being great at what you do, but not being a team player. Because, you know, that may be great. In another firm, that might be fine. You can work in your little cubicle and silo and be a superstar. But here, we're a collaborative firm. So if that's not your... If that's what you do, you're probably not going to be successful here. Or if you don't wake up every day being totally jazzed by creating an experience for a client, well, then that, that's probably not going to be, you know, where, where you're going to be successful. I like that. Your specialty is financial planning and wealth management. As you think about that sphere of your focus, What's been on your mind recently as you look at the financial landscape of our of our nation and, and as financial landscape in general? I think that um, when 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 I was a kid, because I'm I think I'm old, I'm older than you. When I was a kid, I used to think I you know I grew up dumb and broke in Suffer, New York, you know, and I used to look up to people that were successful and were hardworking and go, you know what, God, that's who I want to be, you know, or I want to be that person that makes a difference. You know, in this world, and I and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to go do that. And I think the thing that I'm seeing is that there are people that we now have a culture where people who did it with just hard work and you know, like remember, I, you know, when when you when people say how successful you are, I go, yeah, well, any schmuck can make money who works three jobs because that's what I did to get here. You know, and I don't do that anymore. I mean, you know, I'm not putting in routinely 75 hour weeks like I was before, I'm still working my, you know, what off, but I'm, but I'm, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not working, you know, for, you know, I, I don't uh, go home, take a shower and go back to work like I did in my twenties, you know, or that piece. And I think some, in some ways, this country, we, we now, we now think that somehow um, that hard work, that somebody gave you something or somebody, you know, that, that, that hard work, like so you must've done something wrong to be successful. Um, and or, or there should be some shame in being successful. And and I, again, a poor person never gave me a job. You know, I am, I, and it bothers me that people that have just enough. Well, you know, I'm uh, I have enough for my family. I go, well, that makes you keep if that's who you are. And I know that's not who you are, but if that's the person you are, that makes you the selfish, most selfish person in the world to me because you have just enough for yourself and no abundance for anybody else. What I, I, I want to do is I want to help people create abundance so we can help change the lives of everybody on the planet for the better. And, and playing the scarcity game so that everybody has less to feel better is, 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 is different. And by the way, I'm not for making people feel bad, but I'm for a rewarding the very least. I'm not, I'm not a guy where everybody gets a trophy. I like because that trophy, though. <laughs> it's, well, you can have a, we, we're going to issue a participation trophy, but we're going to also into a trophy for the people that are doing the right thing. And I think that there's a lot of this work-life balance and other things that are just an excuse for not, for not, for not, for not achieving. And then sometimes you'll hear people say, well, yeah, but we, we have to be about the greater good. And I got to tell you, I wake up every day thinking about the greater good, but the only way I can affect the greater good is by creating abundance in the world for everybody else. I can't create scarcity and that's going to create abundance. And and I think that we've 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 misaligned our our kids because you sit back going back to your kids and go when you ask a parent Keith and you say what do they want for their kid the default answer is what do you think the default answer I want my kids to be better than I was I I I, I would that would be an acceptable answer the answer I'm getting is <laughs> I want my kids to be happy yeah you know I that's true I I think I think my parents want a better life for us I think. You're right. I think the the shift is better. Want them to be happy, which 
what does that mean? <laughs> it, it, well, first of all, I think, first of all, I want my kids to be happy too, but I can't, you can't make somebody happy. That's right. got to come from within, not from out, from in, internally, not externally. I want my kids to be hardworking, thoughtful, respectful. You know, it's faith, family, service. That's what, that's what our, our core principles, founding principles in our family are. And I don't see how, you know, that making them happy is, yeah, I'd want them to be happy, but I don't, I don't want anybody to be unhappy. But I think why would, how as a parent or how as a boss or how as a friend or how as a, a brother or a, or, a, or, or, a, or a friend you know, or, or a colleague, how can I, how can I affect your happiness? I, I can't make you happy, but I can, I can give you the, tool, the tools to be happy. And I think, you know, it goes back to our early conversation. I think the joy in life is, is the, the joy in life is the journey. It's not the arrival. So I, I love what you just said. And I think there has been a shift in our country. And I don't know, how do we begin to get people to get, because I just had a guy on my show who's an engineer. And we had a great conversation about the fact that he can't find engineers anymore for his company because the ones coming out are just too dumb to be in his company. Because um, somebody told me he should be an engineer, but they don't have the skills or the passion to be an engineer or the smarts to be an engineer. How do we get to the point where we have dummy down education to where it is just about happiness or about participation trophies? And how do we get back to that faith, family, and focus that you just talked about? Um, you know, I think it's going to be led by entrepreneurs like us. Entrepreneurs are always on the cutting edge. And that's why I'm so passionate to help entrepreneurial people create multi-generational wealth. So that they can help change the focus of this of this country, you know. The other thing I think also is in terms of the division, is that you know that some there's got to be somebody that can unite this country, um, or there's got to be some group of people that can unite this country, because I think there there's you know I I think that we our politicians and social media and and the media itself wants to pit one person against the other for ratings. Or for votes, or for something, and, I, and I'm trying to think. I, I'm trying to think about somebody who truly, not for poli, poli, po, political expediency, did the right thing. You know, or I, you know, I'd be, you know, I'd be knocked over if uh, somebody on MSNBC gave Donald Trump credit for something, and I'd be knocked over if somebody on Fox gave Joe Biden credit for something. You know, uh, <laughs> that he did good. You know that either of them did good. I'd be, I'd be, it'd be, I'd be, I'd probably have a die and have a heart attack right on the spot if if that occurred. You know, if you, you know, and I'm, and I'm thinking, in what, in what world do, in what world are we so polarized that we only report the news or spin the news that fits our narrative? I don't think that's helpful for anybody. You know, where's, where's the place where people, where people get, actually give you information so you can make your own decision? I think we stopped thinking as a, as a country. I think I think we've been fed with what we with what and, and by the way the craziest thing to me when given facts on the other side we dispute the facts <laughs> you know the very fact that that half the country or the entire country only wants to accept what the say the Supreme Court or a federal court or a, or or municipal court decides if they agree with the decision right you know I I I I think that that's that's where we've got to get back to. You know, respect for, for institutions, you know, respect for people. You know, you could disagree with somebody with what they think, but at the end of the day, I think we need to all be friends. Right, exactly. And I think that you're, you're you know, and I, and I think the fact that people saying, you know, I could never, you know, I could, you know, not, I would, you know, that they, they actively, you know, they actively um, exclude people who are different. That's to me just another form of discrimination. Right, you're exactly right. I don't want to go, but go before I get to answer you. Have you talked to us again about your number one selling book? Tell us about your book again. Well, I, I think it was it was a book that I, we came back and I said, well, what is, you know, what's the most, what, you know, what, what could we do to pr bring the most abundance back to this country? And I think ultimately it was to put together a, a put together a playbook that allows people that have an entrepreneurial mindset. That doesn't mean they own a business. Or they're entrepreneurs, but they have an entrepreneurial mindset <laughs> to create abundance, so that they would be able to impact the lives of everybody that they touch, and that the best way to do that was through entrepreneurial thinking. 
and 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 that we've got to we want to change the narrative of how people think because i think i think in the world i think people think that there's a lot of competition and and i don't think there's a lot of competition i don't really believe in competition i believe in differentiation and so how do we differentiate people from from other places or you know a lot of people are saying hey i just want a seat at the table and i'm saying well why do you want a seat at the table i want to build my own table <laughs> why don't we keep able to build their own table and invite other people to their table or you know Remember, it's not the problem; it's how you think about the problem. And I think that, and I think the other thing we want to do for people is we want to, you know, that that so many people have, you know, what I described as already listening ears, already seeing eyes, because the brain is only looking for what the, you know, what the mind is looking for. So how do we train our mind to look for other possibilities? How do we how do we train people to be be aware and to have a different difference in, in thinking? And so one of the things like I pride myself on is is that I see people for where they are, or I try to see people at least from where they are, and and you know all their all their great qualities and all their flaws and all the other things. But I think one of the things that everybody deserves in their life is to have one or hopefully many people who not only see them where they are. We could see them at their highest potential and what they could be. That we could almost raise people to be the very best version of themselves, and work and work and work every day to do that. You know, you know, sometimes that's what you'll hear me when I've not had a good day or done something. You know, I say, hey, you know, hey, you know, hey, you know, hey, Mark, you could do better than that. That's not the best version of you. You're better than that, and that's not how you want to. You know, it doesn't matter what somebody else did. That's not how, who I want to be. And you know, do do we are we perfect? No, I'm far from perfect. But I aspire to be perfect. I aspire to be better. I aspire to be a better version of myself tomorrow than I am today. And I think that that's all we can ask for people. And I think too many people are have given up or or don't have the tools necessary to be able to become the light in the life that they choose that they that they wish they could be. I love that. I love talking to you, Mark. You you are so inspirational, and just the way you think about things, the way you you view other people, and the way you want to invest in others so that they can invest in others. And we can, like you say, expand generational wealth around the world. But I want to know from you, as you think about the impact that you've already had and the impact you're going to have in the future, what message do you want to leave with the world that long surpasses you? You know, I, I'm not the most reflective person in the world. And I think when you think about that, you think about death, which is not something I control. And I'm not looking to happen in the near future, at least. <laughs> Although we we don't get we don't get out of well, nobody uh, none of us get out of here alive. I'd like to say there's no right way to do the wrong thing, or I think that the idea is that that he made a difference in the lives. I, I said it earlier before. I, I sort of been my mantra is like is is uh, is he made a difference in the lives of all the people he touched, and that and that and that the multiplier effect. There's a money multiplier effect. That that drives our economy, and I think that hopefully that 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 I had a, my small role at, at a people multiplier, in that in that what I'm so proud of, Keith, is I'm proud of not the money we've made and the the abundance we've created and the car I drive or the m amount of money in my bank account or all those other things. I think it's all all amazing and far more than you know a guy who grew up in Suffolk, New York should should have. Um. But I, I think that the, what I'm proudest of is the the small little things that we've been able to do, the amount of people we've hired that have been able to send their kids to college or buy the house they wanted to buy, or to be able to take a company and help them to grow that company where they created hundreds of jobs. And then that multiplier created hundreds more jobs and more abundance and more abundance, like the people multiplier so that everybody's life became better because of the small little things that you did that that one little thing, that one little thing, one little kindness, even today, you know, I, you, know I'm, you could say something to somebody that's nasty and ruin their entire day. It happens all the time to people, right? Right. So if that's the case, well, then shouldn't it be that you have the chance that one kind thing to somebody can change their outlook for the day and how they respond to other people? So that just that one kind word that you say to somebody impacts them so that they, instead of them being in a bad mood, they're in a great mood impact five other people in their life that day. 
just a small little difference that we all make. And I think, you know, what am I? I'm, just, I'm one person on a planet of 7 billion people. You're one person. What am I going to do? And on one level, that's overwhelming. But on the other, on the other level, it's amazing how one person can make a difference. You know, what, there's a reason why one of my favorite movies, you know, I, I love all the mob movies, you know, Godfather and uh, Goodfellas and, you know, all those, you know, movies like that. I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of that. But Well, you are, you, you are me, from Jersey, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, but, but I'm saying if you really ask what my favorite movies are, you know, you ask about books, is my favorite movie, my favorite movie, I love Back to the Future, where, you know, when Michael J. Fox is, you know, his, his family was, you know, going down the wrong direction, but just one little thing changed the whole trajectory of his family's history. Or I like It's a Wonderful Life. You get to see that around Christmas time where, you know, where, where um, Jimmy Stewart saw what his life would be like if he wasn't on the planet. That's my, probably my favorite movie of all time. I, I love uh, my, one of my fraternity brothers who's probably 10 years older than I am, Angelo Pizzo, wrote and directed Rudy and Hoosier. You know, where, where, where the small little town can, 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 can have all the glory of a large school. Or, you know, Rudy, I mean, the ultimate underdog story. You know, the, how a guy like Rudy could ever play, you know, a down at Notre Dame is, 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 a, is you know, it's almost an unbelievable story if it wasn't true. And so I think that the idea is that there's always hope. And there's always hope that when you, when you still have hope, you still have the ability to, to succeed. I love that. So, Mark, where can people find your book, The Ultimate Investment, and connect with you well, on social media? They can find it on Amazon. Uh, they can reach me by email at uh, mark underscore murphy at northeastprivate.com. Um, and as I said, I'm, I'm happy to continue the conversation with you anytime or any one of your listeners. And, you know, as I said, I, I just want to be continued to be known as the, as the guy that helps, helps people create multi-generational wealth. Well, Mark, th or the people that multi generate will help them keep it. Well, Mark, thanks so much. I, I really enjoyed talking to you. And, and again, you always provide my audience with such inspirational content and advice. So thank you for what you do and blessings on helping people to look for that next generation and create generational wealth in their lives and the lives of their families. Well, right back at you. I, uh, you know, I, I, uh, it feels good to, to be in the company of a man of such high integrity and character and a man of faith like yourself. And I, uh, you know, so I consider it my, uh, my blessing and my honor to spend this time with you. Well, thank you, Mark. Have a great day. Thank you, my friend.